Well, first of all, let me thank you guys, uh, Raoni, Jonas, all the organizers for setting this up. It's been great so far, even though I couldn't be present at all the, the talks. Um, as you can see, I hope you can see the, the, the slides. As you can see, I'm going to talk about quantum coherentism. Hopefully in the next 30 minutes or so, I uh, will be able to explain to you what I mean by it. And hopefully you will understand maybe why I'm using this picture here as a representation of quantum coherentism. Uh, so let me start off by saying something which is probably obvious, but it's, it's better to make, make it clearer at the outset. Um, so we are all interested in something called the interpretation of quantum mechanics, right? But I think it is very useful to separate two different enterprises. So there are two families of issues which go under the name of inter interpreting quantum mechanics. On the one hand, there is the issue of providing a sort of interpretation of the uh, handbook, uh, textbook, bare quantum theory, or maybe an alternative theory which is able to solve the basic problems of the theory. So it's a technical sense of uh, interpreting quantum mechanics. And basically the idea he here is, you know, the theory is not exactly um, polished. We need to um, improve it in some respects especially as far as the measurement problem is concerned. So interpreting in this sense basically means, you know, choosing between say Bohmian mechanics or collapse theories or many worlds, mainly with a view to resolving the measurement problem. But there is another issue, another family of issues, which is pretty different. In this case, interpreting quantum mechanics means using metaphysical concepts and categories to better understand the theory. So we use concepts like properties, dependence, grounding, identity, indiscernibility, typically philosophical concepts to grasp, um, to gain a better understanding of what the theory is telling us about the world. So in this sense, interpreting basically means putting forward suggestions as to the underlying ontology. So it is in this particular sense that, that, that I'm going to talk about uh, the interpretation of quantum mechanics. Obviously, there are overlaps and connections. So mainly my focus is going to be on the ontology of quantum mechanics, but hopefully the project is also relevant for um, the interpretation of quantum mechanics in the more traditional sense. Um, so my main focus is going to be in particular on quantum entanglement. As you all know, quantum entanglement is one or maybe the paradigmatic aspect of the theory. And it is parad paradigmatic of the fact that it is difficult to uh, actually understand the theory. Quantum entanglement is paradigmatic because it is connected to a number of different issues, including obviously EPR, belt type correlations, non-locality, non-separability. Entanglement is also relevant when it comes to explaining the peculiar feature of uh, quantum statistics. And I think there is also um, very obvious connections between the features of quantum entanglement and the discussion, which is still ongoing uh, on the tenability of humans' Umian supervenience um, in the quantum domain. There are other issues, but um, I don't think I have to convince you guys that quantum entanglement uh, calls for an interpretation in the ontological sense. So let me very briefly um, summarize what entanglement actually is. Obviously, you guys know this very well, but I will be um, very brief. So consider the traditional example. You have two fermions in the single state, and you want to ask questions about their spin values. So this is the single state. We all know that each fermion taken separately can be both spin up or spin down in any particular direction. But then the funny thing is that given the single state, we can calculate probabilities and we know that necessarily the two spin values will be anti-correlated. So we have the same probability of having particle one spin down and particle two spin up or particle one spin up and particle two spin down in any particular direction. And this obviously means that probability zero must be assigned to the joint outcome, both down or both up. So basically uh, what we get is that spin outcomes are necessarily 
anti-correlated in the fermionic case. In terms of probabilities, these can be represented like this. The probability assignments for joint spin values is simply not a byproduct of the separate probability assignments for the particles. This is obviously well known. Um, the slogan is the factorizability of probabilities fails. Okay, so we get two separate particles with separate probabilities. We put them together in some way, and all of a sudden they get connected in some mysterious ways. So the question is, of course, what ontological account can be given of this? We know how it works at the formal level. Probabilities are easy to compute. Describing entanglement system, entangled system is easy, but what is going on? Why do they behave like this? So this is the question that I want to uh, discuss with you guys today. Um, okay, there are many different um, perspectives, but I think it is fair to say that nowadays there are two main uh, competitors on the market. On the one hand, there is structuralism broadly understood, which is roughly the view that correlations correspond to actual physical relations. Or what is new in an entangled system is that this system exhibits new relations. So entanglement must be in a way reified. Entanglement relations are really out there and they are more fundamental than the monadic properties of the separate particles. This is obviously a, a view which is uh, pretty popular nowadays. Stephen French, Michael Esfeld in particular, he suggested the metaphysics of relations. The other option is monism, which is the view which is less popular, but still pretty strong, according to which the peculiar correlations of quantum entangled system are due to the dependence of the parts on the whole. So the quantum entangled whole is a common ground which is um, more fundamental than the parts, and because of this, determines the monadic properties of its components. And as you probably know, this view has been defended recently in the BJPS, I think, or maybe Synthes by Ismail and Schaffer. So it is becoming pretty strong. So I don't want to discuss these two views in detail. Let me just point out one important thing. Um, so we have this situation, right? We have a discussion, a philosophical discussion concerning how to understand quantum entanglement from the ontological perspective. And we basically have these two guys. One is the structuralist and he claims physical relations are fundamental. So the monadic properties of the parts are actually reducible to entanglement relations. So the funny thing going on in, uh, in the case of entanglement is that really we have systems exhibiting genuinely new uh, relations. And this is all there is to say. I draw your attention to this idea of relation being fundamental. On the other hand, the monist will say, well, no, not really, the whole system is fundamental. This is what you're missing. It's not like you have new relations, the system is prior to its parts. So there is a sort of ontological dependence of the parts and their properties on the whole. And this is why you have these correlated um, spin values, for example. So the, the important point for my purpose purposes is that in both cases, the traditional view of reality as a so, so, sort of um, hierarchy, which is structured based on grounding or dependence relation is preserved. This is pretty important because um, it looks like you don't have any other option. You have to be a foundationalist and structuralists and monists alike, they are both instances of um, what I will call metaphysical foundationalism, which is exactly the view that whatever you have to explain about reality, you can only explain it in terms of sort of um, a pyramid of being, whereby something is less fundamental, something is more fundamental, Whenever you want to have a genuine uh, philosophical explanation, you have to use the more fundamental to account for the less fundamental, right? So in, on, in, in the case of structuralism, the more fundamental is relations. So you have to reify them because they have to be basic building blocks of reality. In the case of monism, what is foundational is the whole. 
It could be a local hole, like a specific entangled system, but it could also be a global hole. Suppose you believe that the whole universe is entangled. In that case, you are a strong uh, monist foundationalist because you believe Similarly to Parmenides or Hegel or any other monist in the history of philosophy, you do believe that the fundamental entity is the whole, the universe. This is exactly what I want to uh, put into question. I'm not going to say, uh, I want to be clear about this, I'm not going to say anything against structuralism or monism. I just want to put another option on the table, just for the sake of discussion. And I want to claim mainly that this option does not collapse onto anything already known. It's a genuinely novel option. So let me start off by pointing out that in metaphysics, non-standard views of metaphysical structure are conceivable. An easy way, I think, to, to, to see this is by visualizing it. Suppose we, we want to, um, to ask the uh, ontologist, what, what are you doing? So the basic question is, you know, you have things, that, um, facts about the world. You want to explain them in terms of, you know, grounding relations. And just on a side note, I'm not assuming anything particular about grounding. I'm just using it as a shortcut. Whatever you take it to be the real world counterpart of your metaphysical explanations, I'm calling it grounding. But nothing hinges on this. Actually, I will use a different notion of ontological dependence later. This is just for the sake of presentation. So the point is, as a metaphysician, you want to systematically provide grounds for the facts that you want to explain. Usually, we take grounding chains to be vertical in the sense that I discussed a moment ago. They have to be um, hierarchical. What is grounded is less fundamental than the grounding. Also, we usually assume that there is a fundamental level, something which is able to ground without being grounded. This is foundationalism. But as you can see, you have two empty slots. So just by thinking about possibilities, you could see that maybe grounding chains are vertical. They proceed from the more fundamental, from the less fundamental to the more fundamental, but there is no um, bottom level. This is known as metaphysical infinitism, which is a view that I like very much, but I'm not going to discuss it today. Another option is completely different, and it consists in denying that grounding chains have to proceed vertically. Metaphysical explanation, in another, putting it slightly differently, doesn't have to be vertical. It could be horizontal. So the claim that I'm going to make is that it makes sense in metaphysics to do the same thing that, say, Quine did in epistemology. It could be that, at least in some cases, your basic building blocks are not structured as a pyramid, but rather they depend on each other in a network. So grounding chains, in this case, they, they go horizontally. They form a coherent network or web of being, so to put it. And this is the reason I'm calling it coherentism, of course. So let me give you a bit more detail in case you're still thinking about it and how it works. Um, slightly more technically, but th the same idea. Metaphysical structure is normally understood in terms of what in um, mathematics are known as strict partial orders. And on top of this, we have this assumption of uh, there being a fundamental basis to be. So sum summarizing, we take grounding or whatever you want to use, dependence, uh, supervenance, whatever, as uh, having these particular properties. It is irreflexive, it is asymmetric, it is transitive, and it is well-founded. Okay? I think this is pretty clear. Right? If you take any two entities, they are such that they are not grounded on themselves, um, if A grounds B, then B does not ground A, and so on. Now, this is foundationalism. What does a coherentist do? Basically, coherentism amounts to uh, two moves. The first one, you drop assumption four. So you don't think that grounding chains have to have a basis. Because obviously, if you, are, if you are a coherentist, there is no basis. Maybe there is a network. There is no basis in a spider's web, for example. 
And then you also drop two. This is the crucial point I want to discuss. If you're a coherentist, you have to admit that in some cases, uh, cases at least, um, grounding or dependence relation can be symmetric. They don't have to be asymmetric. Now, the delicate point is that, as you probably know, uh, asymmetry follows from irreflexivity and transitivity, just by uh, you know, uh, conceptual analysis. So if you uh, renounce asymmetry, you have to also give up irreflexivity or transitivity or both. So this is where the um, trouble starts for the coherentist. So transitivity seems very intuitive, right? If A grounds B and B grounds C, we cannot possibly deny that A grounds C. So my take is that irreflexivity has to go. So if you are a coherentist, you have to accept that um, your uh, basic relations, the relations that actually work uh, you know, as the glue of reality, they can be reflexive. Now, the obvious objection here is that reflexivity is really bad in this case, because grounding, as I said, is the counterpart of metaphysical explanation and metaphysical explanation in general cannot be uh, reflexive, right? Because in the end, one could say, well, look, Matteo, what you're saying is that you have this sort of explanation in your metaphysics. A is such and such because A is such and such. In other words, if you admit of reflexivity of grounding, then you end up with something like this. A grounds A, or A depends on A. I do think this is a strong intuition, and it, it is basically the reason why coherentism has never been taken seriously in metaphysics. But I think intuition does not have a bite in this case. Let me briefly say why. Okay, my first reply is this. The circularity, if there is circularity at all, is not between the explanants and the explanandum. The coherentist doesn't have to say that A explains B and B explains A. My take is that really we can get interesting explanations if we admit of scenarios like this. You have two entities, A and B, and they are mutually dependent. And this symmetric dependence between A and B is the explanation for something else. Hey, I hope you see the difference. One thing is saying A depends on B and B depends on A. And that's it. Another thing is saying two things are mutually dependent on each other and this is the reason why dot 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 where the dots you can fill you can fill them with whatever explananda you have okay okay this is very generic so uh, i hope we'll be able to discuss it more in the q a if you have questions but let me move on my second reply to the circularity objection is this look even if there is circularity it's not obvious, at least it's not obvious to me, that reflexive relations cannot be the basis for genuine explanations. Um, instead of arguing in favor of this claim, let me use an analogy. Consider the epistemological debate about justification, right? In particular, you have something similar to uh, coherentism, metaphysical coherentism, in the debate about justification. You're probably familiar with it. The question there is, what is the structure of justification? Do we need to have you know, a pyramid with fundamental self-evident uh, beliefs? Or can we go on ad infinitum? Or can we be coherentist a la Quine and believe in uh, interconnected sets of beliefs? Now, a traditional objection again, uh, against epistemological coherentism is that really it is not tenable because it's circular, non-informative. And indeed, there is a sort of a linear or naive formulation of coherentism in epistemology, which is very weak exactly because of this reason. In that case, you get something like this. You, you, you have a system of beliefs, take this very simple system with three beliefs. What you get is that A justifies B, B justifies C, C justifies A. In the end, what you get, there is no way up, is that take any belief, that belief fully justifies itself just because you're assuming transitivity, symmetry, and reflexivity. So whenever you have a cycle or a loop, you do have trivial explanations. So I agree with this. But the point is that there is an alternative. In epistemology, the more 
uh, popular version of coherentism is a sort of sophisticated coherentism. And this is my model for metaphysical coherentism. So let me say a few things about it. The idea, roughly, in the case of sophisticated epistemological coherentism, is that you have a bunch of beliefs, maybe the beliefs of a specific subject, or maybe possible beliefs, they do something together. They determine a specific belief structure. And then these, suppose you have this bunch of beliefs here, and you have different connections, justification, being a good reason for, being evidence for, they are connected in complicated ways. By being connected in these ways, they give rise to a new thing, which is the belief set. And the sophisticated coherentist claims, once you have this belief set, then the set may or may not have specific properties. It could be coherent, it may not be coherent, it could be useful for the subject, it could be informative. In case the set as a whole has certain properties, then S in turn lends support to each particular belief. So what you get on this picture is that each belief is justified by the other beliefs, but it is not the case that each belief fully justifies itself. I hope you can see this. This sort of holistic formulation of coherentism allows us to avoid circularity or vicious circularity. Now, let's set epistemology aside. In the metaphysical case, my claim is we can do something similar. Take a bunch of physical entities broadly understood. The metaphysical coherentist can claim, look, the joint existence of any bunch of things physical entities in the broadest possible sense, determines the existence of a specific whole or plurality S, which is a different thing from the separate entities, but it's nothing over and above the set of uh, all the entities. And then what happens is that this whole or plurality constrains and shapes the specific features of each particular component, right? So this is perfectly analogous to the epistemological case. What I'm claiming is that this allows us to say that without vicious circularity, it could be the case that in some uh, scenarios at least, you have a bunch of physical entities, each one of which partially depends on the others. And of course, each one of them partially depends on itself because it is itself part of the plurality. But dependence is only partial, and I don't think we can discuss about this. I don't think um, reflexivity of partial dependence is in any sense counterintuitive. This is the key claim. Now, let me point out one important thing. Um, it, as you can see here, I say whole or plurality. This is crucial because if you believe in a plurality, you're not committed not necessarily committed to the existence of the whole, of the, say, neurological sum of the axis, right? This is important because it is um, the basis for the distinction between coherentism and monism. If you're a monist, you have to believe that you have this bunch of entities and on top of them, you have the whole. And actually the whole not only is a different entity, it is more fundamental. As a coherentist, I'm rejecting this. The picture is different. There is a plurality of things and nothing else. Each one of these things is equally fundamental, okay? So I hope you, uh, you have a grasp of this. Now, summing up, metaphysical coherentism is the view according to which it is the case, or at least it is possible in some cases that you have some entities, each one of them partially depends on, or if you prefer, is partially grounded in itself and all the other entities in a plurality. In virtue of this, this set of entities constitutes a, what I call a connected plurality. It's not just a bunch of things, it is a structured bunch of things. Exactly in the case of entanglement, we have this, right? It's not like any two particles give rise to entanglement, okay? So the connected plurality feeds back, on, so to put it, on the separate entities and determines the properties of these entities. Now, this determination can be in many respects. So let me be 
specific about this. You can go more fine-grained, and it, it, actually, it's a good thing. Grounding is too generic. What I'm saying is that you can be a metaphysical coherentist about specific respects of dependence. So, for instance, one possibility could be that some things only exist in a plurality. Think about quarks according to the bag model. As you probably know, quarks can only exist at least at you know, low energy regimes in triplets, right? This is a form of um, symmetric existential dependence of the sort I have in mind. Matteo, have five minutes now. Yeah, okay, uh, I'll speed up. Um, another possibility is to be identity dependent. So two things might have their identities determined by the fact that they, um, they are connected to each other. A third respect is a qualitative profile. If you look at the properties of things, it could be that the monadic properties of two separate entities depend on the properties of the other entity. And this is what I'm claiming uh, actually happens in, in um, entanglement uh, scenarios. Just a side note, um, if, you, if you're interested about technical notions, maybe you're familiar with the notion of quasi-reflexivity, which I think is really interesting to make and really useful to make sense of these sort of connections, but um, um, it's not essential, so let me skip this. So in conclusion, let me um, say a few things at least about entanglement. Uh, what I'm suggesting is to apply metaphysical coherentism to the quantum case. Entanglement, if you're a coherentist, can and perhaps should be understood in terms of contingent mutual relations of dependence among different particles. And in particular, this dependence determines the properties and possibly, but not necessarily, the identities of the entangled particles. I say possibly identity because I think coherentness can be perfectly neutral about individuality. You know, identity could be intrinsic or extrinsic. If it is extrinsic, then you can be a coherentist about it. It is extrinsic because it depends on the existence of other things. I know some of you guys care about identity and individuality, so maybe we can discuss this. Um, so basically what happens, take again our singlet state. Upon the right kind of interaction, when you prepare an entangled system, then the existence and properties of, say, two fermions determines the existence of a plurality, which we call the entangled system. This plurality has specific properties, say, total spin zero. This is a property of the plurality. By existing, this plurality in turn constrains the properties of one and two. And of course, you know in which way. It constrains the possible uh, outcomes of measurement in the way we already discussed. Um, briefly, I'm just mentioning this. It, I'm not saying that there is a rigid essential dependence. It's not like any fermion can only exist if that particular fermion also exists. It is rather a generic conditional dependence. If you are a fermion which is prepared in some specific ways, then you become dependent on some other fermion. Okay. Couple of remarks, very briefly. This is not this is not monism. I'm not committed to the existence of a whole, and I'm not committed to the claim that the whole is more fundamental. Second remark, this is not structuralism. I'm focusing on relations, but I'm not reifying entanglement relations. I'm claiming that there are traditional, more or less, traditional objects and monadic properties connected by mutual dependence relations. Then, of course, these mutual dependence relations are something we can find in the theory. So they are physical in this sense, but they are not physical in the sense which I take structuralists mean, in the sense that they are actual building blocks of reality. And I think this is wrong even in terms of understanding the formalism. It seems to me that, you know, the formalism of quantum mechanics tells us that entangled systems have separate reduced states. So there's nothing in the formalism, I think, that tells us that, you know, entanglement relations must be taken seriously. We can only find relations in another sense, putting it slightly different, uh, if we already believe in structuralism, okay? Again, we can discuss this later. I, I have to go quick because time's up. 
So summing up, I think coherentists have to sit at the table at least. Take your time, Matteo, please. Uh, I, I forgot. Now you have five minutes. Uh, oh, I forgot right. that. Yeah, that's magic. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, so um, I'm almost finished anyway. Um, the, uh, the basic idea is this. You have this table. Philosophers try to interpret um, quantum mechanics, sit there. And so far, we have these two guys. Entanglement relations are fundamental. Entanglement, entanglement holes are fundamental. And very minimally, I want to convince you that coherentists should sit at the table as well, because it is a genuine sui generis ontological perspective according to which entangled parts are mutually dependent on each other. OK? And then, of course, uh, on this, I have to be brief because I couldn't expand on it. I'm just giving you a hint. If you are not dismissive about metaphysics in general, you could be. But if you are, you don't take structuralism or monism seriously either. If you, if you are playing the game and you think that structuralism or monism is explanatory, then I think quantum coherentism is at least as explanatory. Because you, you defend the same intuition, right? The intuition being that quantum entangled systems are in some way connected to each other. So just to give you a couple of examples of, uh, of um, coherentist accounts of basic quantum stuff. In the case of uh, EPR Bell correlations, for example, the coherentist should say something like this. Obviously, we should elaborate on this. The slogan is, of course, you're not finding causal accounts of you know, non-local correlation or uh, non-separability because the root of this phenomena is more uh, fundamental. It is deeper than causality. It is a basic fact of symmetric dependence. Then again, you could find this non-informative, but in that case, you're not doing metaphysics. If you do metaphysics, then I take this to be a genuine account of what going, what's going on. Or take quantum statistics. Um, it is my idea that it, it is at least possible to explain the peculiarities of quantum statistics in terms of statistics describing correlations between possible outcomes rather than classical monadic properties. So I need to expand on this, but basically the idea is the puzzle with quantum statistics arises because we take quantum pro properties to be monadic properties in all cases, but this is not obvious. In particular, I think the coherentists can explain the impossibility of non-symmetric states by invoking these basic symmetric dependence relations. If you take a bunch of identical particles, they are mutually dependent. So no surprise that you don't have non-symmetric states. Again, we can discuss it later. Okay, this is obviously work in progress. There is a lot to do, so I'm just giving you a list. We need to say more about dependence, about properties. Um, there are many possibilities to explore. I've been working on, for example, the application of this to a sort of um, hylomorphic understanding of quantum systems. I think this is very relevant for the discussion of human supervenience. And I think if you believe in this mutual dependence relation, then you have a good argument, a good reason for actually seeing why the Hume-Lewis stance is so difficult to defend on the face of quantum mechanics. It is difficult to defend because Lewis and Hume are working with a basic assumption, the basic assumption being free recombinability. What does this mean? It means that the basic building blocks of reality are completely independent of each other. And this is exactly what I'm uh, questioning. So no wonder if you're a coherentist, you will be against uh, human supervenience. Uh, one last thing, it is important to see that coherentism doesn't have to explain everything. I think it is promising as an account of, say, property uh, assignments and probability distributions. But we could be pluralists in, uh, in metaphysics. For example, we could be coherentists about properties, but also foundationalists about neurological constitutions and maybe structuralist about you know, the relevance of symmetry groups or the continuity across uh, theory change in the history of science and so on. And of course, I left open how this applies to specific interpretations of quantum mechanics in the first sense, 
And it is really interesting that in my perspective to see whether this can be applied in, say, um, relativistic quantum, um, relational quantum mechanics or Bohmian mechanics and so on. And of course, we should expand this uh, beyond quantum mechanics, but this is really a uh, work in progress. So I'm just showing you the final summary without reading it. And thank you very much. Thank you, Matteo. That, that was awesome. Thank you very much. Now we have 15 minutes for discussion. If you want to ask a question, please use the raise hand button. We have Otavio as the first questioner. There you go. Okay. Hey, Matteo, what a wonderful talk. I really like it. Uh, uh, thank you, Otavio. Very clear, nicely laid out. Um, let me just uh, ask you something. Um, once, since you're willing to move towards a coherentist uh, picture, um, does it really make sense to even talk about grounding in any sense at all? Right. I know that you real, you know, you say, look, we need to give up some of the structural relations here, um, and then I think the idea of dependence ground uh, it's actually counter uh, counter to the um, to the very spirit of coherentism right mm. because of course there are there are dependents among the nodes of uh, of the network uh, but it's not in any way that even resembles uh, what uh, a grounding or a metaphysical dependence would look like and I think that that shows <laughs> up for example when you you try to explain the relation between the whole and the parts in the, in mm -hmm. the case of the entanglement right because um at that at that stage um one wonder uh if a worry that often is raised against structuralism cannot be raised uh there also for the coherentist namely uh, you know the familiar concern the structuralist wants to say well uh, structures are fundamental, or relations are fundamental, but relations are uh, dependent in some way on the relata. Uh, so how can we uh, have those uh, relations being bona fide metaphysically um, prior in, in any respect? Now, what's interesting about coherentism is that you want to do without that, because look, nothing here plays any fundamental role. Uh, yeah. But then you need to earn it. Uh, when you to do that, right? So take take that very seriously, and yeah. um, and then think carefully when you're trying to explain entanglement whether you can really talk about ways in which uh, uh, the parts and the roles roles cons are constrained with one another in the way that you want to to constrain them, right? Because it seems to me that if you do that maneuver, you're just going to be playing back into exactly the same priority worries that the structuralist is faced. And so my yeah. suggestion is, look, be a, a coherentist, right? And the coherentist will say nothing, everything is up for grabs, right? Uh, every part in the network could be uh, abandoned, could be revised. You have mm -hmm. these interconnections, right? But the explanations are not as tight as they would have been. Uh, if we were foundationalists uh, in, in any sense, right? Yeah, thank you very much, Otavio. This is the, the, the key point of, of the project, I think. Um, let me uh, split my answer in two parts. The first part is I agree with you that grounding is really loaded. I mean, usually we simply define grounding as the counterpart of asymmetric metaphysical explanations. And this is why I was really careful, because in the past I was, uh, you know, I was lobbier on this respect and people said, well, this is contradictory. Uh, okay. I don't want that answer. So uh, set grounding aside, however, I think one of my points is basically to question these assumptions about metaphysical explanations. If we simply take for granted that whatever actually does explanatory work has to be included in a sort of asymmetric structure, if not in the world, in our discourse, then, uh, well, I don't think coherentism goes that far because I, I end up with something which is purely descriptive. You have particles, none of them are, is more fundamental than the other, and that's it. No, I want to say more than this. 
what I want to say is that there is something, I mean, a physical glue, which connects the two particles in a horizontal way, exactly contrary to the spirit of the Lewisian uh, reductionist uh, view of the world. Of course, if I give up on this, then uh, it's too easy a target. I mean, it's not even interesting. So uh, I understand what your concern. Maybe I need to be more precise. I need to be more careful where exactly I, have, I can push this project. And I completely agree with you. And that's why I said it's work in progress, especially when it comes to defining exactly what you mean by dependence. Mm -hmm. But I'm pretty convinced I cannot simply do without talk about dependence in some places, because I want to say, look, when you have an entangled system, this is what goes on. When you prepare a system, whatever happens physically, this is for the physicists to tell us. Metaphysically, what happens is that you construct new symmetric dependence relations. You may not like them, but as I said, if you do metaphysics, you, you need to give a reason. So we are doing metaphysics here mm -hmm. and we like dependence. So it, it, we are assuming that it can do some explanatory work. Now, I need to be given a reason why symmetric dependence cannot. Okay, so let me, you know, turn the tables against you. I, I, but I agree with you. I mean, your um, your comments is really useful in a way because you know you you identify the, the weak points of the project. Thank yeah, no, th this is uh, no. It, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, maybe you can div divide in stages, right? Because you say, look, once you prepare the system, then of course you establish some relations. Yeah. Uh, but but then you cannot ignore that you have prepared the system and say, well, and and then you look back from the, those uh, interdependence and say, wow, they also depend on the preparation or they determine something about oh, it. Oh, sure, sure. So, and maybe that's a way of introducing some asymmetry. Uh, right. It might be a pragmatic point, uh, which count, goes against the metaphysical uh, uh, bit, right. but it's a way of at least factoring out the, the, the stages. Um, I don't think it's purely pragmatic. If you, um, well, that's why uh, towards the end, a very brief. Sorry, guys. Oh, okay, I, sorry. I, will, I will interrupt your follow up because we have four more questions. Thank oh, you again. Okay. Okay. Uh, Thank don't you, Matteo. No. Please. Yeah, I, I would be very fast because no, I see no, it. Don't shut first. Sorry, Chris. Oh. Uh, sorry. Um, hello. Um, sorry. Hi, Matteo, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Hello, Matteo, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, thanks. Um, can you so hear thank, me? You for, thank you for the great paper. So I, I can hear you, yes. Um, okay. So this, this is really a quick question, which is, which is following on from what Ottavio said. And at, at some point, when you introduced the idea of um, the metaphysical counterpart to epistemological yes. coherentism, you, mm -hmm. you remarked that what you, what you were trying to do was to suggest that reflexivity of partial dependence wasn't so counterintuitive and that that was one of the one of the um things you wanted to lay out it seems yeah. to me that if you thought before this paper that that um reflexive grounding was counterintuitive it doesn't seem to me that what you said there really removes that because to me the fundamental problem is not that um is not with um, such and such a thing is hosted by itself, but rather it's the thought that such and such a thing is explained by even in part by itself. So there mm. seems to be something, well, there's something misfiring about, about um, if one asks, why does X exist? And your response is, well, among other things, X exists because X exists. And yeah. the same thing seems true of, um, of X having certain features. So I think that's the counterintuitive point. And I think that sort of like to all the different moves that are available to you, but it might help to maybe divide up the, the claim about reflexivity of explanation from other um, um, discussions to do with, let's say, transitivity. And maybe reflexivity is more counterintuitive or the, the counterintuitiveness is deeper than in some of the other cases of maybe non-transitive explanation. Yeah, thank you. So that's uh, it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I agree with you. I mean, this is the basic point I have to convince people of. I have to convince my, myself in the first place. But I don't think it's that simple. Of course, we should expand more on this particular point. 
My claim is basically that we need to look at the specific details of the scenarios we want to explain. It's not like, you know, saying um, it is obviously circular to claim that A exists at least partially because A exists. On that sort of examples, I completely agree with you. But if you go more fine grain, you have different sorts of explanations. That's why at some point I introduced uh, this notion of respects of dependence. It could be, say, that, you know, um, the future spin values of this particular fermion depends on the actual um, categorical disposition for spin of this particular fermion partially. This is, I think, at least slightly less uh, obviously circular because it gives you a more complex story, connecting, for example, categorical properties and manifestations in the future of a particular disposition. So that's what I'm saying when I say we need to work on the details of the actual process in the entanglement case, and obviously in any other explanation that you want to give in coherent terms. I completely agree with you, but I wouldn't make, I wouldn't be ready to give you that in general, uh, reflexivity of partial dependence is bad. You need to go uh, fine grained and do it in a, in the right way. I cannot say anything more satisfactory. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you, no, guys. Thanks. Christian. Okay. Thank you very much, Matteo, for that for the talk. It was very interesting, very clarifying. And thanks. well, I, I wanted to to. I'm worried about the other part, the part about entanglement. So, so my question is very quick. What, what notion of entanglement are you taking? Because we are talking about particles all the oh, time. Yeah. I, I guess we we both agree that quantum mechanics doesn't talk about particles. Sure. Right. So, so um, what notion of entanglement are, are you? Because it, it's, but it, it's quite problematic. What what's the meaning of entanglement? Uh, I completely agree. Um, I, I'm not sure whether I used inverted commas uh, on a first instance of particles. I completely agree with you. Even though maybe you know that I'm uh, sort of uh, trying to resist all these uh, um, claims against individuality. Well, you, like, we can talk about it. I don't think it is that obvious, but I agree with you. If we have in mind this idea of classical particle, you, you simply don't have it. But I think for my purposes, it is sufficient to, to think about two separate systems, physical systems, not particles, whatever they are. They come from different places and you put them together in the way you do when you prepare entangled systems. Whatever they are, they were two and now they are one thing, which I call quantum entangled system. Then, of course, you want to explain what it is and you may use measures of entropy or um, degrees of non-separability, but basically for my purposes, what, it, what is relevant is that if you don't have entanglement, you don't have EPR bell type problematic correlations. If you do, then this is what I mean by entanglement. It is very, very generic. And I know that for a physicist, it is too generic, but for my purposes today, at least it is sufficient to, to tell you guys, whatever you call it, uh, we don't need to worry about what the ontology is particles, maybe, maybe, I don't know, waves, events. It is a fact that sometimes in the laboratory, we, you take two things, you put them together and they exhibit correlations. Very simplistic, but enough for my purposes, because you have to explain those correlations, okay? Sorry, I know it, 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 is, it is not very sophisticated. <laughs> Hi, Thomas, do you have a one minute question? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I can be very brief. Uh, thanks. Thanks for a nice talk, Matteo. Uh, I just wanted to actually make a, a, a small point about the setup. Um, uh, we can talk more about the, the details of your own proposal later on. Um, so uh, you noted that the structuralists and structural realists are, uh, are also committed to metaphysical foundationalism. And I just wanted to question that because mm -hmm. some of them, at least my colleague James, uh, is, is pretty clear that he's actually not committed to any there being any fundamental level now yeah. maybe it's important to point out here that it's it's different to say that relations may be prior to uh to uh, the relata the objects 
And another thing to say that there's a fundamental level consisting of those relations. Yeah, sure. so, so James sometimes puts it that it's relata all the way down, uh, or relations all the way down rather. Um, so yeah. it's just, I mean, it's not really changed much of what you want to say, but it's, it, it, may, it might be more accurate to, to list structuralists uh, as infinitists in that sense. No, absolutely. Uh, this is why um, in that slide, what I actually say is that both structuralists and monists share this idea of a, a hierarchically structured reality. The foundation bit comes later when I introduce metaphysical foundationalism. And of course, you have these two parts to conventionalism, verticality and well-foundedness. And I agree that James rejects well-foundedness. But for example, Stephen French is a monist and he's a structuralist. But sometimes, at least, he, he considers the option. So there are different combinations and I should be careful about it. So yeah, you're right. Thank you. Fair enough, yeah. Thanks. Thanks so Martin. let's thank you, uh, Matteo. I'm, well, sure, I have I'm a sorry. Question, guys. I was last in line. May I ask a question? Okay, you go ahead, Maru. I'm going to be very fast. Matteo, great for your talk. Uh, I you. know you quite well. You are a very brilliant and clear speaker. But I'm wondering whether you forgot about time. Namely, if you apply these entities and you consider them somehow coherent, uh, don't you have to assume that there is some sort of space-like relation mm. linking them? And relativity tells us that you cannot have a space-like relation between entities that are, so to speak, in the elsewhere region. So if you go into the physics of all this, I think you're running against relativity. But the second point is that if you have certain conditions in cosmology, namely, uh, you don't have any causal pathology in your space-time, <laughs> so that the Lycon don't tilt and they are stable, then you have cosmic time. If you have cosmic time in certain models, then you don't have any coherence because uh, your causal relation is asymmetric. So whenever you have causal uh, time evolution laws, uh, you don't have any coherence in the sense that you are discussing with us. Sorry for, for the length of my question, but why don't you use this to uh, shed light not just on entanglement, which is a very good job, but also on the fact that in physics you have evolution laws and not just laws of coexistence. So um, yeah, thank you very much, Mauro. I, I will be very brief because I think we are late. Uh, two quick answers. The first answer is that, um, yeah, if you understand the connection between um, space-like separated entangled systems as a causal connection, then you have to respect relativity. My hint, my idea is that this is why you shouldn't go for causal explanations. And then the alternative is non-causal explanation, which I call metaphysical explanation. And then of course, as I said, if people don't like it, then this is a dead project. But uh, I'm assuming this, you cannot get causal explanations, so try this. If you don't like it, then there is no explanation. That's, I'm not that's assuming some, causal explanation. I'm not a two, I, I'm not Bohmian in this sense. No, I'm saying relativity doesn't forbid symmetric dependence for sure, right? Even at space-like uh, distance, it, it, it is not a physical concept, so it cannot forbid okay. it. <laughs> All right, then we agree. Okay. I, I know you're skeptical about this, but this is the entire uh, um, the, the basic assumption you cannot get a physical explanation. So this, this is what we should try to do. As for the rest, yeah, I agree with you. We need to try and expand the project to different domains, but you know, it's still in One its uh, infancy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Great. Thank you very Thank much, Matteo.